Welcome everyone to the Campbell webinar series. My name is Roisin Corcoran and I'm extremely honoured to serve as the co-chair of the Campbell Collaborations Education Coordinating Group. Part of the reason why the work of the Campbell Education Coordinating Group is so important is because our products provide robust and accessible reviews of what works in education. And reviews have the potential to impact or, or benefit many audiences, including teachers, principals, superintendents, policymakers, funders, and researchers, by providing them with the tools that they need to make better and evidence-based decisions. And our esteemed panel today are going to discuss systematic reviews and work within their own organizations and really how we can better maximize the impact of that work. So the title of today's webinar is Systematic Reviews to Inform Policy and Practice in Education, the Campbell Collaboration Education Coordinating Group. I'm gonna start by giving you a very quick overview of the Campbell Collaborations Education Coordinating Group. And this will be followed by presentations from our panel, which includes Mark Schneider, the Director of the Institute of Education Sciences at the US Department of Education, Finbar Sloan, Program Director, the National Science Foundation, Jonathan Kay, Head of Evidence Synthesis at the Education Endowment Foundation, Sarah Miller, Director of Campbell UK and Ireland and the ECG Co-Chair and Editor, and Patrick LaBelle, ECG Information Specialist. And the Campbell webinar is financially supported by the American Institutes for Research. And I wish to sincerely thank the AIR for their continued support. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, you can put them in the chat or you can reach out to presenters directly. And just to note, this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available on the Campbell Collaborations website event page. Okay, so let's get started. Sarah, if you can forward through to the next slide, please. So on this slide, you're going to see our webpage, which you'll find at www.campbellcollaboration.org. And you'll find lots of information there about Campbell and about the Education Coordinating Group. But basically, the Education Coordinating Group is an international network that includes scholars, policymakers, practitioners, and funders who are all interested in evidence based practice, policy, and systematic reviews related to education. The ECG, we focus on areas such as compulsory school age education, special education, adults and professional education, early childhood education, higher education, speech and language pathology, disability, literacy and STEM. So we have a very broad remit. And education was actually one of the very first coordinating groups that was established when Campbell was founded back in 2000. So we're one of the longest serving coordinating groups in the Campbell collaboration. And we do receive financial uh, support from Queen's University Belfast, which we're very grateful for, and that funds some staff time. Okay, next slide, please, Sarah. So the Campbell collaboration we have four key objectives. The first is to produce systematic reviews of interventions, instruction, remediation, and treatment in education. These reviews focus on substantive topics through the summary and analysis of high quality research evidence provided by studies that use quality controlled research methods such as randomized control trials, quasi-experimental designs, and single subject designs. We also support systematic reviews involving studies that focus on process, implementation, qualitative, and participatory methods 
studies. The second objective is to establish a network of collaborators who want to undertake or contribute to the production of systematic reviews. The third objective is to facilitate consumer involvement in the group's activities. Consumers are considered to be partners in each step of the review process, from priority setting through to initiating and conducting reviews and right through to disseminating results. And the final objective is to provide training in the form of workshops, courses, symposia that will help to guide our authors in producing systematic reviews. Next slide, please. So who are the ECG? Who are the people that are involved in the education coordinating group? As I mentioned, I serve as the ECG co-chair along with uh, my colleague, Sarah Miller. And we also serve as uh, the representatives on the Campbell Systematic Review Journal Editorial Board. And as co-chairs, we are responsible for the strategic leadership and fundraising within our team. We also help to maintain the internal governance and make final decisions regarding policy and implementation. And Sarah Miller, who's at Queen's University of Belfast, she also serves as editor. In terms of our methods editors, we have Ryan Williams at the American Institutes for Research and Kira Keenan at Queen's University of Belfast. Our associate editors, And we have some authors that are conducting evidence and gap maps. The second strategy component is to build a sustainable and collaborative network. So we're looking at different funding models to ensure the sustainability of the education coordinating groups. And over the next year, we'll be working on appointing a new advisory board. We'll also be helping our practitioners and policymakers to support the use of evidence, so making better use of the ECG products, and finally to increase the capacity to produce our reviews. Uh, next slide, please, Sarah. So how can you get involved? Lots of ways, really. You can join a review team, you can co-author a review, become a lead or co-author, of a new systematic review, for example. You can serve as a peer reviewer, and we're always looking for colleagues to serve as peer reviewers in their areas of expertise. You can help to organize Campbell seminars or symposia at education conferences or different events, and also signing up for our newsletter, newsletter to uh, stay uh, abreast of kind of what's happening in the education coordinating groups. You can follow us on Twitter, uh, and we're also on Facebook. So if you'd like to participate in any of these activities, just please reach out to us and our email will be on the last slide, which we'll show later on. Okay, so that uh, concludes my part of the presentation. I'm next uh, going to hand this over to Mark Schneider, the director of the IES. Uh, before joining the IES, Mark Schneider was the vice president and the Institute Fellow at the American Institutes for Research and President of College Measures. Prior to joining AIR, Dr. Schneider served as the Commissioner of the National Center for Education Statistics from 2005 to 2008. In 2013, the Chronicle of Higher Education selected him as one of the 10 people who had the most impact on higher education policy that year. He's the author of numerous articles and books on education policy. His book, The University Next Door, edited by K.C. Dean, was published in 2014 by the Teachers College, uh, Columbia University. Other books include Getting to Graduation, edited with Andrew Kelly, published in 2012 by the Johns Hopkins University Press, and Higher Education Accountability, edited with Kevin Carey, published by Palgrave in 2010. Charter Schools, Hope or Hype, written with Jack Buckley, was published by Princeton University Press in 2007. And Schneider's 2000 book, Choosing Schools, also published by Princeton University Press, won the policy study organization, Aaron Wildowski's Best Book Award. Dr. Schneider was a visiting scholar at the American Enterprise Institute 
and distinguished professor emeritus at, of political science at the State University of New York, Stony Brook. Welcome, Dr. Schneider. Thank you. Um, so my apologies because I'm not going to talk very much about the uh, about how to uh, merge data and and um, I'm going to talk more about how IES is supporting um, the data that would go into systematic reviews. So so that's our job really. Our job is is to try to make the data and research and experiments and evidence. Well, you know, there, there's the slogan: cheaper, faster, better. Choose two, right? We don't believe that we're trying to push on all three to make things cheaper, faster, and better. So the, the one point that, that um, is overlap with regard to the, uh, the mission of, of this group and IES, of course, has to do with the What Works Clearinghouse, which is one of the first and one of the largest clearinghouses in the, um, in, certainly in education and, and was a model for other clearinghouses in other government agencies in, in the United States. Um, so the goal is, we are constantly trying to modernize it to again, to make it faster, better, cheaper, more accessible and more usable. Um, we are, we've been thinking about this for some time now and we're in the, like everybody else, we're trying to figure out how to use modern information technologies to make the gathering of the data, the synthesizing of the data, the evaluation of the data uh, in, to put into the clearinghouse faster and better. Um, yesterday, by coincidence, I had a, 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 a meeting with the, um, a company called uh, Learn Platform, and the model that they have is something that I find extremely intriguing. So they entered into business arrangements with school districts, and the, the, the deal that the reason school districts, and there are thousands of them that have signed up with Learn Platform, they say, look, we are spending over $20 billion a year on ed tech, and all the evidence is that maybe 80% of ed tech products are not being used. So we will monitor your business processes, who signs on, when they sign on, how long they sign on, and we will give you concrete information about which of your ed tech products are being used, which ones aren't being used, so you could make better decisions about renewing licenses or what products to keep buying. But as they do so, so they're providing an essential business service for school districts. But they have now entered into partnerships where they can, in fact, use that platform to gather lots of information about lots of school processes, about school assessments, about the use of evidence. And they could gather all this information with, at minimal intrusion into the school. And any intrusion that they have in the school the school is getting a benefit from the business processes. So rather than sending a researcher into a school and saying, oh, we want to do this and we want to do that. And the school says, I don't have any time. You know, what's the benefit to me? The deal here is, is, is really very neat. I'm going to give you, I'm going to save you a bunch of money on your, on your business processes. In return, I'm going to help you figure out what evidence is behind the things that you're using. I'm going to help you find better evidence and, I'm, and, and actually, I may be able to run some experiments with you, or I may be able to do systematic reviews with you. And this is, to me, this is like a really innovative idea about re reducing the, the extent to which we intrude upon and burden schools by giving them something that they really need. And in return, we're getting information that we ultimately, we, we haven't done this yet, but the, the discussion yesterday was like, how can we use your processes to increase the number of studies in the What Works Clearinghouse, how can we use your processes to better standardize the way that schools are reporting the data? And as soon as we standardize these models and the standardize the, the intake forms, we're gonna be able to include many, many more studies in the, in, in the What Works Clearinghouse. So it seems to me that that kind of exchange, that kind of deal, some people talk about it as the digital exhaust from business processes, that that's one of the things that we need um, we need we need to think about really carefully. So next, um, I, I just want to talk about some of the other innovations that we're using to try to increase the generation of evidence-based interventions, right? And how we move from a business model that I inherited and is twenty years old, which I call the three F business model: five years, 
$5 million failure. Most things don't work. We know this. So we spend five years and $5 million to fail. And then we don't learn from our failures. That's one of the one of our biggest problems here, right? So we have we have hundreds of studies, hundreds of studies that have not produced the outcomes that we expected. And they're just lying around moldering away without anybody systematically investigating what lessons are possible from uh, from from that drawer full of failed experiments, a crazy, 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 crazy way of, of doing business. So we've hired um, um, Larry Hedges and Beth Tipton to go through these files and to help us identify what fails as compared to just what works. Um, the, other, the other thing that we're trying to do is to increase the rapidity of which we can conduct experiments. We are in the middle of an X prize right now that um, there are 33 platform owners with at least 100,000 students in it that are that have enrolled in the XPRIZE competition. The, the, uh, the prize will be awarded to the company or companies that are best at generating rapid um, experiments and, and replications, right? So, so I'll, I'll talk about this a little later, but the fact of the matter is education sciences doesn't have a replication crisis like other sciences have. And the reason, because we don't replicate, right? But it, once we start replicating, we're gonna, we're gonna fail, right? But the, if you don't replicate, you're never gonna be able to answer the, the primary question that drives all of us, what works for whom under what conditions. So the way we're envisioning this is that you run an experiment short term on one of these platforms. You don't have to recruit the students, they're already there. You run the experiment, it works for this group of students, works for that group of students, doesn't work for that group of students. You replicate it at least five times. Within one year, you have to do the experiment and at least five replications, and you have to show us the, the algorithms, the criteria by which you designed the, uh, the replications. And then you have to tell us how, if there was more time, you would do the next round of replications. So uh, Jim Manzi talked about this, like fail fast, right? I don't want five years to fail. I want five weeks or five months. So fail fast, what works, replicate, replicate, replicate. The other thing that we're trying to do is, not trying to do, we are doing, we have the X Prize competition for digital platforms. We're about to launch a prize for middle school science, uh, a, a prize for elementary school math for students with disabilities. We're doing an automated scoring challenge uh, to use with NAEP, the, the, the uh, large scale national assessment. And we are um, working on a high school data science challenge. That, that one's more, it's turning out to be more challenging. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that we, like we're, we're like everybody else, we're pushing data science and we want to m create and support a high school data science competition that at least in the short run is, uh, I'm sorry, in the long run will be modeled after the, the high school robotics uh, competition. In the short run, we're trying to figure out how to, how to, make, it, uh, how to make it work. Um, the other thing is we are um, we're really trying to change the nature of education science uh, research. So right now, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like a handcraft industry, right? Some university faculty member or somebody at AIR has an idea, they go and they, they, go and they recruit their schools, they, the students. It's like, it's like cobbling together a study. It's not, the way, it's not the way we should be thinking about this. So the platforms are, we, we've not only running the XPRIZE platform, but we're investing $10 million in a, a network of platform providers, the goal of which is to create an infrastructure of platforms, right? So people don't have to go and recruit all the students and all the work they sign on and they use someone else's, uh, some existing platform to do their experiments. Uh, Neil Heffernan's assistments is the, the, the classic example. The, the, the idea that we're, the next infrastructure project that we're thinking about is large scale data. Um, and you know, to create a data repository for large scale data um, that is ethically, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna say ethically sourced, uh, so I sound like a fisherman, but it, no, but it, you know, that, it, that is, it, 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 there actually are standards, ethical standards for the collection of, of data that's being used for AI uh, training purposes. We have to make sure that those are there. So the goal of creating this repository is simple. There's a truism among AI researchers that 80% of their work is 
finding data and 20% is actually running the, the, the models. We wanna flip that around. We're, we're thinking about how to create a data repository that would have large scale data, large scale data that is accessible for people that wanna train their, uh, um, their data systems. Um, so we, we, we're trying, okay, we're I, trying. I, okay, two okay, last things. Yeah, okay. Okay, two last things. One, we, all of these things are designed to, to solve the, the critical weakness in so much of our work, small ends, right? We all know the problem with small end studies and we keep doing them. So how do we break out of the small end one? And then the last one, I mentioned this before, is like we need more and more and more systematic replications. And I don't care how we do it, but probably the way we're betting is, is, uh, is on platforms, but we also spent God knows how many millions of dollars on, on these handcrafted replications. That's all. Well, thank you so much. So much information there. And as we say, this webinar is being recorded so you can listen back to it. I certainly will be. Thanks so much, Dr. Schneider. Probably at a slower Fantastic. speed. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so we're going to move forward to the next presentation, uh, which is from Dr. Finn Barcelone from the National Science Foundation. Dr. Sloan received his PhD from the Measurement Evaluation and Statistical Analysis Program at the University of Chicago. He has been a program director at the National Science Foundation for the last 10 years. In the Directorate of Education and Human Resources, he has served as lead or co-lead for multiple research programs, including the Early Career Research Program, the Education Core Research Program, and he serves on the cross-agency committee dedicated to harnessing the data revolution. He was Associate Dean for Research at the School of Education at the University of Colorado, Boulder. He was chair of the 10-member faculty team in mathematics education research at Arizona State University, and Associate Dean for Research in the College of Education at Arizona State University, and a researcher in the Center for Research in Engineering, Science, Mathematics, and Technology Education. His research has been funded by the Irish Department of Education, the Institute of Education Sciences, the Joyce Foundation, and the National Science Foundation. He currently serves or has served on the editorial boards of the American Journal of Education, the Journal of Applied School Psychology, Mathematical Thinking and Learning, and Irish Education Studies. His research has been published in the Irish Education Studies, Teachers College Record, Educational Researcher, Theory into Practice, and many other venues. He has held office in the International Society for the Learning Sciences and was a board member of the AMB Foundation. Welcome, Dr. Sloan. Thanks, Roshin. Um, I'm sorry, looking down through the list of people, and it's nice to see Carol Confang and uh, Terry Piggott. Terry and I went to graduate school together, and I know that at some point in time she was on the uh, methods committee for Campbell. Um, so, if you'd go to the next slide, please. My my talk will not be at all like Dr. Schneider's. Um, mine will be much more rudimentary. Uh, what I want to do is to give people a sense for the four divisions within the directorate for education and human resources. There are four, one is in graduate education, one undergraduate education, one in human resource and development, and the last in the research on learning in formal and informal settings. Um, with respect to that last division, next slide, please. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, that we have four different solicitations that are currently in play that each and every one of them afford the opportunity to fund research synthesis. The Education Core Research Program is our basic research program within, within Education and Human Resources, and it crosses all four divisions. So put simply, any of the questions that, that might be eligible for synthesis can be parsed by graduate education, undergraduate education, and K-12 education. The Discovery Research Program K-12 is a misnomer. It's a cradle to, to grade 12 program. Uh, we just found that it's very difficult to put in pre-K-12 and have people understand what DR pre-K-12 means. But if you read the solicitation carefully and you do work, 
before formal schooling, we're more than happy to fund synthesis in that space. Uh, similarly with informal and, and formal learning systems. Um, and this technology experiences for teachers and students. Now, uh, next slide, please. There are certainly caveats with this work. The, this education arm of the National Science Foundation resides within a science foundation. So the syntheses that we're most interested in and would fund over and above others include syntheses in STEM education, technology education, engineering education, and mathematics education. If you'll notice the periods between the STEM, in the US at this point in time, STEM has become a sort of synonym. Um, but uh, there are, we get very few, and we see very few proposals for STEM education. We see them within the context of science education or mathematics education or engineering education or technology education. So just to be aware that when you see STEM without the periods, it isn't referring to some entity that has to combine these phenomena because they don't get delivered as, uh, as, as an integrated edifice. That said, you know, if you come in uh, to us looking for a research synthesis, uh, regarding, say, reading or reading comprehension, if it isn't in the context of a STEM area of a STEM content area, under law, we're not eligible to fund it. So we, so for folks who might be on whose expertise would be in reading research, or in reading comprehension and the like, the overlap between reading and the STEM content area would be pertinent. And how you build out a team with those overlaps would be up to you, but but we won't take a reading, we won't easily take a reading researcher per se, unless the and we will not fund something that doesn't uh, indicate some overlap between the role of reading in the learning of mathematics, for example. The proposals that you would submit would be to a specific solicitation. So you'd have to go back to one of those earlier um, areas. And the, the, the slide that comes up will, will functionally give you access to each solicitation. Um, and ECR will fund synthesis and methodological advances. So we will also, on the method side, pick up an advance on, on meta-analysis, for example. Uh, when I look down through the list, we've, we have funded in the past people like Larry Hedges, Terry Piggott, um, Ariel Allo, who's one of the current co-chair on, on the Methods Committee, um, and, no, and numerous others. So the two stories I want you to take from this is that we're more than happy to fund research syntheses. We have four different programs that are willing to do it at this point in time and at different sizes of uh, uh, different levels of support. But we're also willing to, and more than happy to fund methodological advances in those spaces also. Uh, next slide, please, Sarah. So these would be the four solicitation web pages. And then if we would go to the next slide. And that's you guys, okay. So, which is fine, thank you. Um, I. Uh, I would like to say that I've spent some time on the Campbell website recently, as in earlier this morning. Um, and one of the dilemmas that I have, and Terry will understand this dilemma quite well, because while I mentioned Terry earlier, Terry and I were uh, in the same cohort in that measurement evaluation and statistical analysis program at the University of Chicago. Terry, I won't say when we started or when we finished, simply because it would just date the pair of us, but they can't see you currently and they can tell that my hair is gray. Um, one of the dilemmas that I personally have in the space and having looked at some of your work is that very quickly, a lot of, um, a lot of potentially valuable studies get deleted from these reviews uh, on the meta-analytic side, certainly. Uh, simply because the, the designs aren't great. And, and that, that's a reasonable condition. No fans or bots. 
However, uh, when I'm when I'm funding studies of this type, I try to ask the PI as the um, when we negotiate the award. So the the award goes through review, but then the program itself is allowed to ask extra questions and ask for other products. And one of the things I think that would add value, um, it adds value to us, and I believe would add value to Campbell as well, would be an annotated bibliography of what either the treatment or the in interventions are. So one of the dilemmas when you go to a policymaker and say, um, you know, doing more mathematics with, with children with learning disabilities and, and paying attention to their needs is important. And that's, a, uh, and it is important, but how do you build a policy out on that? There's no policy to be built out on that. It, uh, it doesn't have the same, you know, telling someone that you have a point three effect size for 12 studies or 15 studies or 20 studies without giving sort of some grist to the mill of what some, how those effects are generated in practice uh, is absolute, is, is a sin of omission, I think, because it doesn't give you something that you can act on from a policy perspective. It gives you very little to go to teachers with. It gives you very little to go to school superintendents with in, in the US context. Um, are saying that uh, cognitively guided instruction gives an effect size of anywhere in the range of 0.2 to 1.0 without saying what, what CGI is, without saying how it's implemented, without saying how much professional development is required, what's the length of the professional development, what are the component parts of the professional development, what kinds of changes you'd want to see in teachers, both knowledge and behavior, so that you could have some sense that if you were moving in that direction in the school system, what would be needed to replicate that study, not, not, not as a field study, but to replicate it in your own school district. And so I think sort of trying to take the richness of the quality control that comes around the research methodologies that produce the effect size, while also adding to that the richness and depth that's required to make a policy valuable would, would be a, a pertinent endeavor. And we do that in a sort of slipshod way, program officer to program officer. Um, and we're, we've been thinking about it uh, a lot more recently as we've moved into the space in the last few years. I'm quite sure I'm pretty close to the end of my time. So I would just say yeah. thank you and I return the floor to the next speaker. Thank you so much, Finbar. Wonderful comments and lots for us to think about, um, I think, even beyond this, beyond this webinar. OK, so our next speaker is Jonathan Kay, uh, who's the ev head of evidence synthesis at the Education Endowment Foundation. He works to promote the use of evidence in schools and policymaking. Jonathan is responsible for the evidence synthesis work at the Education Endowment Foundation, including the Teaching and Learning Toolkit and the Guidance Reports. He recently authored the EAF Rapid Evidence Assessment into Remote Learning Approaches. And Jonathan has been at the EAF since 2014 uh, in a number of roles, including leading the policy team and the publication of reports on EAF funded randomized controlled trials. Welcome, Jonathan. Thanks, Roisin. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the way that we get our evidence synthesis products to, to have an impact, particularly on practitioners, be that either through direct communication to practitioners or, or to policymakers. So, as you mentioned, our, our key evidence synthesis products are the Teaching and Learning Toolkit, which is an evidence portal that we communicate to school leaders, and the guidance reports that we produce on topics like Key Stage 1 Numeracy, um, or metacognition that provide actionable guidance to teachers on evidence-based approaches to teaching. We also do other activities. We also fund randomized control trials, um, but I'm gonna focus on, on evidence synthesis and, and how we mobilize those evidence synthesis products. Next slide, please, Sarah. Um, 
And, and the first thing I'll talk about is some of the preconditions to getting that mobilization to be successful. One of the things that we spend a lot of resource at the EEF thinking about is about making research as accessible as possible. Um, and that isn't just a, a kind of a plain language summary. That is all of our primary products are, are targeted directly at school leaders and practitioners and, and never really written for an academic audience. We, we do produce the technical reports and appendices for due diligence. But the core of our effort is about practical, accessible resources aimed at school. So on the left, you can see our teaching and learning toolkit. This is a summary of around 30 systematic reviews and meta-analyses, and we communicate them in terms of how much the cost, of, uh, how much the approach costs, in terms of how secure the evidence is with a, a padlock rating, and in terms of months impact, um, which we, we get from effect sizes. So we never communicate the effect size apart from in the technical appendices, we convert it into a month's progress impact, which we've seen has had much more cut through with teachers and currently around 70% of school leaders access the teaching and learning toolkit. We get about a million page hits on this website per year. It's, it's really had cut through in the system. One of the key things as well that we do is exemplify the evidence when making it accessible. So working with schools to produce things like case studies, as you can see on the right, um, and also making sure that none of our language is technical. So you can see at the bottom right, we don't talk about heterogeneity, we don't talk about metaregressions, we talk about what's going on behind the average and communicate everything in a really plain language summary. Uh, next slide, please. The next thing we do in terms of a precondition to, to uh, action is providing actionable guidance, particularly through engaging stakeholders throughout our evidence process. So when we do our guidance reports, we commission an academic team to produce an evidence review. Um, but then that academic review goes to a panel of practitioners, of experts to translate those systematic review findings into actionable guidance that can be exemplified and applied in the classroom. So, so thinking about the salience, thinking about relationships with current practice, thinking about the cost and effort and implementation challenges of any of the recommendations that are coming out of the, the guidance report. Uh, next slide, please. And then in relationship to, to that kind of accessibility, the other thing that we do, which relates to some of the things that Mark has been talking about, is think really carefully about relevance. And relevance can come from um, that practitioner voice and targeting the research effectively, but it can also come through being quick to produce reviews. So we do um, occasionally use rapid review methodologies when responding to things like COVID. But more importantly, what we're trying to do is build the evidence infrastructure so that we can conduct high quality systematic reviews really quickly. So a good example of this is, is making use of things like the automated search and screening features in, in resources like Epi Reviewer. But more importantly, what we're trying to do is cultivate a database of studies. So everything in the toolkit and everything in our guidance reports now goes to one central repository with full data extraction and coding on outcomes, context, pedagogical features, so that whenever we do a review and we pick up similar studies in our searches, we can get access to all of that data immediately without doing data extraction again. So building that underlying data infrastructure allows us to be more relevant. Uh, next slide, please. So once we've got those resources that are based on, on really high quality research, but are also accessible, also relevant and, and also actionable and engaging with practitioner voice, we spend a lot of time thinking about really active dissemination approaches. And we do that in two ways. The, the first way is thinking about active dissemination to practice. So very early on, we did randomized control trials into research use and the normal things you do to disseminate research, conferences, handouts, things like that, had unsurprisingly very little impact in terms of behavior change at all. So what we've moved to is a much more active dissemination method. All schools receive printed versions of our guidance reports, which look nice and are very well published, which is actually a part of the battle. But then we have a network of research schools that really actively provide school to school training sessions and also have a number of target schools that they work with in, in really active consultancy type relationships about embedding evidence in things like school spending strategies. So we have a really active practitioner to practitioner dissemination network. Next slide, please. And then finally, 
We also think about active dissemination in terms of engagement with policymakers. And EF was a, a what works centre. We're, we're lucky to be funded by central government, but we're funded through an endowment which gives us independence and operational independence over a 15 year time period. Um, and so what we can do is independently advocate for the use of evidence in policymaking. A good example of this is things like advocating for evidence to be flagged as a crucial part of school spending. So the image on the right, that is a requirement for all pupil premium spending in England, is that they need to make use of evidence when coming to funding decisions. And EEF resources are, are flagged on that page, directing people towards our evidence products. The second thing that we've begun to do in terms of that active dissemination role of policymakers is we've been asked to play a role where we independently quality assure uh, training programs that are provided by the government to schools. So we go and we work with uh, the, the policymakers and we essentially look at the things that go into those training frameworks and anything that isn't based on evidence, we recommend its removal. So we say that that doesn't have a good source, that isn't an evidence-based recommendation, it shouldn't be part of core teacher training. Um, and at the end of that process, we have the option either to say we endorse this framework or to say that we don't. And, and in pursuing that EF endorsement as an independent voice for evidence use and credibility within the system, it gives us the ability to leverage and apply high quality evidence to training programs that will be used to behave, uh, change the behavior of teachers throughout the system, whether they've heard of the EF or not, or whether they care about evidence use or not. Next slide, please. So just finally, some, some reflections from, from the first 10 years of the EEF. So, so the first reflection is schools in England are really actively using research and evidence to inform practice. If, if you told us 10 years ago that 70% of school leaders would be accessing an evidence portal, I don't think we'd have believed you. But we're spending a lot of time investing in evidence infrastructure, accessible content and dissemination networks to put that research to good use. And I think key takeaways for, for people on this call I'm really keen for opportunities for collaboration, things like data sharing with that evidence infrastructure, opportunities for funding for those systematic reviews will be advertised at, at that link. Um, but the very fact that we have this really established active dissemination role, both in policy and practice, means that EF can be a really good resource for disseminating high quality evidence um, that's produced by organisations um, such as Campbell collaborators and, and, and people like that. So really keen to, to collaborate and, and get the best evidence used throughout the system. Hey, thank you so much, Jonathan. Fabulous uh, presentation, lots of information. And I, I strongly do encourage uh, those listening to go and have a look at the EEF website. It, it really has a lot of information and resources. Um, so our next presentation is from Sarah Miller, uh, my wonderful colleague and, uh, and co-chair also of the Education Coordinating Group and editor of the Campbell Education Coordinating Group. She also serves as director of Campbell UK in Ireland. She's a professor of education at Queen's University in Belfast, and her research focuses on children's social and emotional development and academic attainment. She has considerable and methodological and statistical expertise, which includes the conduct and analysis of randomized controlled trials, as well as systematic reviews and meta-analysis. She's the co-author of Using Randomized Controlled Trials in Education, published in 2017 by Sage Publications. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it has been unexpectedly high pressure moving everybody's slides on, so I'm quite relieved now <laughs> to be moving my own on. Um, Having said that, I've lost a little cursor. Um, so I'm just going to be quite quick, actually. I think probably a lot of people on the call are familiar with the Education Coordinating Group and what we do. But what we wanted to do when uh, Roshi and I were thinking about today's webinar is to give people who maybe aren't so familiar with us a little bit of a flavour of um, the work we do, the editorial processes involved in that, um, and maybe just some sort of top tips if you're thinking about doing um, a review with the Education Coordinating Group. And if you're thinking about it at all, please get in touch with myself or our managing editor, Carrie Hall, and um, we'd love to talk to you. Um, and you'll already probably be familiar with the fact that, you know, doing a Campbell review really 
It means that your review will be recognised for its high quality and its methodological rigour. And we try to provide a very supportive editorial process so that you're not just getting feedback in terms of um, what maybe you need to improve about your protocol or your review, but you're actually getting help and support along the way from the, um, the ECG, certainly. And we would run clinics that would uh, be there to, for authors to avail of if they, they wish to. We also in Campbell have a pioneering methods group, which covers not just um, quantitative um, methods, and you'll have heard some uh, active authors already mentioned today, but also qualitative methods and qualitative synthesis. And um, so that is being, uh, those methods are being developed. Um, your review will be published in the Journal of Campbell Systematic Reviews. Um, and certainly for us in Campbell, and it really speaks to what John's just been saying about knowledge translation and policy relevance is really a key driver for us in terms of the reviews that we want author teams to be taking on. And you'll be enjoy, uh, joining an enthusiastic community of systematic reviewers. And um, it's a good family to, to be part of. I can absolutely attest to that. So my first fail is actually not being able to find the forward button for myself. There we have it. So if you are thinking about a review, make contact with us early on in the process so we can really help inform how you're thinking about um, your review question and really encourage you to take time to formulate your review question so that it is of policy and practice relevant. So you're embedding that within your review at the very start. You know how it's going to be useful and who it will be useful to. It's not something that you're thinking about at the end of your review. And you may want to do a systematic review or your scope may be broad and you want to consider an evidence and gap map. And um, so whether you are thinking of an intervention or a non-intervention review, whatever sources of evidence you are considering, please do get in touch with us and we can certainly help you uh, make those decisions if you need it. And certainly one of my main bits of advice would be to assemble a review team that represents a really good mix of all the expertise that you will need from the content expertise to the methodological expertise um, and certainly information information retrieval, as you will hear from Patrick um, after me, um, is a key um, fundamental foundation really um, to your review. There are three main steps in the editorial process and we will be there with you um, the whole uh, way through these. From title registration, um, where you're registering your title with us, um, and that's usually reviewed and approved by the editor and there's a, um, a quick turnaround of two to three weeks of that. And then your protocol, which is really your roadmap, as you will know, to your review. Um, and this will be reviewed by, when you're ready to submit it to us, it'll be reviewed by two content experts, a methodological expert, an information retrieval specialist, and also will receive an editorial review, which at the moment is me, but we have associate editors who are doing um, that role as well. So you'll be familiar with the publication process where you make your changes, you resubmit it, um, but you certainly get very comprehensive feedback, not just on your protocol, which is published in the journal, but also then on your final review. And with the final review, we also ask authors to write and we would um, help you write if you need this guidance on the Campbell uh, website to create a plain language summary, which often is that bridge, that communication um, with the um, the public and if you have a stakeholder engagement group that is engaged with your review they can very much help you shape that as well and certainly in terms of the practical considerations all of us who have been involved in um, undertaking reviews will all have had experience i'm quite sure of underestimating both the time and the resources required and um, to to do it and um, so definitely there are resources out there to help you uh, try and uh, figure that out in advance neil hadaway certainly has um uh, an app that you can use for that. But maintaining the engagement of stakeholders, certainly we would encourage you to engage with stakeholders, not just at the start, but through the whole process um, of your review. And the only other thing I would say is that the challenges aren't ours alone to resolve. Drawing from other disciplines is so important. We see that all the time in methods um, to do with well, certainly in RCTs and then through to systematic reviews. So have a team that uh, reaches across the disciplines so that you can draw on that expertise and sort of uh, cross those barriers and um, incorporate those multiple perspectives um, as well. 
that was probably a little bit of a whistle stop tour. And um, if you get the slides afterwards, these are certainly the um, sort of resources that will be helpful to you in providing more information and certainly follow us um, on Twitter um, and through the Meta Evidence blog if you get a chance. Um, I didn't have anyone sending me reminders, but I hope that that was kind of under time or at least within time. Russian smiling at me, so I think it might be okay. But I will hand back to you now. Thank you so much, Sarah. Again, wonderful overview of the ECG. And, and just to reiterate some of those points, we are very committed in the Education Coordinating Group to mentoring. Uh, and if you look at our editorial board, you know, mentoring the next generation early career scholars. So we really do encourage you to get involved. We are committed to making sure that this is a, an inclusive, a supportive and a diverse community. So we would love to hear from more folks that really want to get involved in the ECG. It's, it's a wonderful team to work as part of. Uh, okay, so our next and final presentation is from Patrick LaBelle. Patrick is a research librarian at the University of Ottawa. He has expertise in guiding social sciences and education graduate students and researchers in completing different types of knowledge synth synthesis, such as systematic and scoping reviews, he offers advanced workshops on the topic and contributes to online guides and resources explaining steps involved in the methodology. He is extremely well versed in databases and complementary screening techniques, having assisted or worked on numerous reviews over the past 10 years. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you. So I'll keep this brief because uh, what I liked about Sarah's comment that the foundation really is the search strategy. And I just wanted to make this analogy of, of the, the search strategy being as important for a systematic review as following lab procedures or experimental guidelines in a, in a, in a, a lab or experiment setting. So I think that's important to keep that in mind. So what I tried to do is summarize some of the key steps involved in preparing a, a strategy that's effective because the, the impact that your review will have is based on the effectiveness of the search strategy itself. And I think there are some steps that having worked with researchers in the past, I've seen have been steps that have been uh, just missed or, or excluded from the process. And also I've joined the ECG um, in, in February of, of this year, so it's fairly new, but the protocols that I've seen so far, there are some elements that, that are missing as well. So really just knowing about all these steps, I think is important. So one of the first key points is really looking at previous reviews. Have anything, has anything recently been published on the same topic? Just to give that example of a protocol I recently reviewed, well, within the last year, there was a very similar review that was published by another journal. So just keeping that in mind to avoid replication, but also looking at previous reviews to help inform the search strategy that you develop. I think that's important. Also, maybe looking at two or three studies that you know will be included in the final review, using those to validate the effectiveness of the search, making sure that, that those two articles or three re references are in the results that the databases will find. Then really looking at ERIC as the primary database for education, there are others available. It does have its limitations, but definitely one that should be included in reviews being submitted to the ECG. And also when within ERIC using not only keywords, but also considering the controlled vocabulary. So the subject headings, there's research that shows that systematic reviews published without using subject headings miss studies that for whatever reason didn't use the keywords that the researchers used when developing their strategy. If it's possible, I'd highly recommend it to get your search strategy peer reviewed. Um, there's different uh, tools available, probably the most um, the most uh, the most popular one is the press checklist, which is just basically a list of, of questions to ask to make sure that your search strategy is meeting a variety of criteria. And then obviously is translating that strategy into diff for different databases, running the searches themselves, and then considering the uh, gray literature piece, which uh, there's a great appendix in the Kugli and uh, others uh, publication from 2017. And if we move to the next slide, you'll see that full reference to that um, searching for studies guide that's published on the Campbell website. That's a great resource for anyone wanting to learn about how to structure their search strategy, that whole component of finding, finding the literature for your, your review. The next points here, are, I'm just going to quickly touch on a few of them, but um, making sure that uh, you're, you're trying to be international in your coverage, 
we tend to focus a lot on English language studies or studies published in English. Uh, there's a lot more if you can consider that as well as part of your review. Looking at published, but also the unpublished literature, so all of that gray literature, as I mentioned already, combining keywords and subject headings, using complementary strategies that include citation searching, hand searching, uh, looking at bibliographies of included studies, contacting authors for conference abstracts that might be, that there, for, for which there might be data available. Um, and then really being sure to document the whole process. One thing I didn't mention on the slides or in the previous uh, um, model is really, if you can, to involve an information specialist, a librarian uh, on your team can really help uh, make sure that all of the aspects that I talked about are sort of covered in that process. Thank you. Hey, wonderful. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, I think we are closely running uh, to time. I might just, we just have a couple of minutes uh, and there's a wonderful conversation going on in the chat and we certainly will continue this offline. But I might just ask um, Mark and Finbar and Jonathan to answer one quick question, which is what are some of the, or, or give us maybe one lesson that you have learned uh, and that we could learn from in experiencing, in, in, in excuse me, communicating evidence to enhance impact. So if you could just very briefly give us kind of your top lesson learned uh, in how to better communicate evidence, uh, whether that's, you know, with other policymakers, with practitioners, with funders, what could we learn from that? So maybe we'll start not to put you on the spot, but Mark, maybe you could just tell us what, what is your top lesson that you have learned in communicating evidence that might help us um, at the ECG? I think Mark might have dropped off. Yeah. yeah. See, okay, uh, yeah. will we move to Fimbar? Maybe you could give us yeah. kind of what's so, your uh, top lesson. Yeah, so I think um, we also fund training. So our, our community is a community of researchers, and we want higher quality research syntheses. And topics like meta-analysis or meta-synthesis or, or the reviews of literature writ large are not often taken up in, in the training of, of folks, uh, even, even at the PhD level. So students will sort of muddle their way through it as they approach the literature review in the context of their dissertation. But, the, but there's nothing necessarily systematic, like going back to Patrick's uh, rendering in, in, uh, of the things you might do. I mean, you could look at those and say, that would be a really good way for a doc student to consider how to do their literature review for their dissertation. Not how to combine the data, but how to get the appropriate set of resources in the first place. So um, we fund a, we are we fund training programs and, and methods as does IES, and uh, and one of the funded programs of, of work in that currently there's uh, one by Hedges on advances in um, quasi experimental design, including things like propensity score matching and, and, and the like. But there's one by Terry Piggott on uh, introduction to meta analysis and advances in meta analytic tools. So my audience are really researchers and i'll return now to jonathan who has way more experience of and, and also in my conversation earlier you got a sense that how frustrating that can be right uh, because you get these synthesis and then the texture of them or the grain size of them map to a research audience but don't map more broadly and i was absolutely thrilled to hear to, to hear jonathan's presentation and i thank you for it jonathan so sure, yeah, if I had one tip for, for thinking about have evidence having an impact, it's think about the theory of change for your research. So we think about theories of change within research a lot, but rarely when disseminating that research. So think about what are the barriers and enablers to that research actually changing behaviour at the end point. And if in your theory of change, there is a big gap between publishing the research and behaviours actually changing, then that is a problem and, and thinking about those active tools to dissemination and even if it's instrumental behavior change being the way to do that then then those options should all be on the table but yeah actively mapping out 
that theory of change with the research use is, is just as important as in the research itself. Well, thank you both so much. Wonderful um, presentations. And I want to just finish by thanking all of, of our presenters today. Uh, it's been a wonderful webinar uh, to close out the uh, Campbell webinar series. Thank you so much for all of the information you shared. And again, feel free, free to reach out to us. This conversation will continue, I'm sure, offline. Uh, and once again, thanks to everyone who attended today. Very grateful for your participation.